Welcome to our 2023 annual meeting of the membership. So happy to have you out here tonight. It's been a very busy year. We've had a lot of activity across the state at uh, all four of our locations. Uh, open and close does not matter. We're still getting the business of preserving, conserving, and celebrating Arizona's history done and out here for the long and out here for the great people in the city. So that's what it's about, that's what it's here for, and we're so happy to welcome you back for that year of reflection, celebration, and commemoration. So that in mind, uh, to get ourselves started, are we officially online with Zoom? All right, fantastic. So we're gonna get ourselves started here. First things first, uh, we are gonna be doing a reception after this, after this presentation. So I'd like to thank our uh, donors and sponsors who have made this possible across, uh, made this event possible. So we have Arizona Contracting, the Impatience by Sergio, Four Peaks Brewing, Mortensen, and Friendship Village. So please give a big round of hand for those supporters who make this all possible. Thank you. Fantastic. And with that in mind, uh, for those of you who have a chance to see our tours, great to show you what we've acquired, what we care for, where it all takes place, because by and large, the conversation is always, as members, you see and know more than anyone else in the uh, general business department. You know, you get to see what we have behind the scenes. That 3% that's on display is nothing by comparison to 97% of our collections and archives that are hidden away from the public. And the chance that we get to give you to go back, get in the back rooms, and get a chance to interact with that hidden history. It's so exciting for us as well. So with that in mind, we're going to get ourselves started here in today's presentation. I'd like to invite our board president, Linda Whitaker, onto the stage here to join us for our whole opening remarks. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, this has been uh, a hell of a year. And I can tell you as board president, it has been double hell uh, of three years. Um, but it hasn't been boring. We got a lot done. We have a lot more to do. Um, we are living in some very interesting times right now. First time ever in the state. Um, and I'm going to just share this with you. It might make you a little nervous. Um, so I've been very lucky to have a fabulous board. And I was serving one of the first governor appointed boards when I started um, about five years ago. And that transition has been fascinating. And it has, despite a lot of naysayers, has turned out very well for us. Very diverse, statewide, smart, talented, dedicated people. I think the governor appointed board has worked out well. Um, and this year, we have a very interesting situation happening. Uh, we have 25 seats on this board. There's usually always some openings because it's hard to find uh, people willing to serve from certain parts of the state. Having said that, um, we had um, 11 renewals. Uh, people who have served in the first four year term agreeing to serve their second year term. And we had three new board members also coming on board. Great people, great selection, a track record for these people. And it turns out none of them had a hearing. So they, we have no new board appointments currently, but one hopefully we think, but the renewals didn't get, they didn't get a legislative hearing. You have to have, the governor can appoint, the governor can approve, you can go through all the steps, the background checks and so forth, get approval, but the legislature needs to approve you. And there were no hearings. There were no hearings for any boards of comm commissions. This past legislative se session, and there were none scheduled for the next legislative session. So I'm just saying that we're in perilous times in some ways and uncertainty, what used to be just um, slammed up fast, easy, um, is no longer the case. And I don't know where this is going. 
but um, currently we have 16 active board members. Uh, of those, nine have been renewed, but they have only one year to serve. And then something happens after that year. And if we get no new people appointed, that you subtract nine from the 16, now you're down to a board pretty thin. So I don't know where this is going exactly, um, but we're, we're writing it out. We have enough people to serve for the next year for continuity, but I'm saying this is the first ever. So what is happening nationally is now happening here. It's affecting this agency and it's affecting boards and commissions and there are over 200 of them in this state across the board. So I'm um, just sharing that with you to um, politics up close and personal. Um, new times, um, but um, when I think of the last three years of what we've faced, we've survived it all. And I think we'll survive this I just don't know where things are going currently. Okay. Um, all right. Calling this to order. Um, I have about uh, 240, 247 or 243. Uh, maybe you're recording already. Um, roll call. Robert Ballard. Desiree Barkeed. Wayne Brown. Colleen Byron. I don't have a, I don't have a cell phone. That's you. Kelly Corset. Eric Floor. Tom Foster. Bruce Gwynn. Is here? Okay. Uh, Richard Powers. That. Sherry Rampey. Yay, Sherry. Greg Scott. Jim Snitzer. Linda Whitaker. Yes, I know. Oh, he's here. Jim's here. Okay. Greg Scott. Is Greg Scott there? Okay. Um, now we're going to have uh, just the board votes only on this. Meeting minutes from last year. Then we have a motion to approve. Second. Thank you. Um, any nays? Hearing none, we will, any yays? All those in favor, can join in. Okay, um, then these minutes are approved and we will go on to Robert. So with that in mind, uh, we are now ready to move on to the next section here. For those of you who have been in the uh, and been uh, visiting us in person, we passed out upon your registration those voter uh, slips so you can cast your votes for our no board roster. Uh, joining us on stage here, we have Robert Ballard from the nominating committee. Robert, thank you, David. Uh, thanks everybody for coming, and thank thank you everybody for supporting this great society. Um, so I was asked to be chair, um, willing to be a chair, willing to help out the organization. And I, Wynn Brown and Matthew Hernandez were in the committee. Uh, we went around and we pulled every board member for, um, to see if they wanted to run for one of the officer positions. Uh, we had four positions. We were able to find three candidates for three positions. <clears throat> we'll get to the uh, fourth one later. So at this point, I'd like to tell you who we have, and you can see it here on the list. Um, President Linda Elliott Nelson, Vice President Denise Bauer, she's out here, and Secretary Deborah Bateman. Um, congratulations for the nominations and so with, with the treasurer, what we're going to do, we were not able to, well, we did have candidate, but because of the scenario Linda talked about, we lost our candidate. Um, so what we would like to do now is 
call for nominations from the floor, but we've got uh, two rules with that. So um, it has to be a board member that you're nominating. Uh, membership can do it and board members can nominate. And that person you nominate has to confirm acceptance. So they can reject that nomination if they do not want to fill that position. So do I have any calls from the floor? My name is Linda Elliott Nelson. I nominate Linda Whitaker as the writing candidate for treasurer. Any other nominations for any position? Once, twice, gone. Uh, so, Linda, do you accept that nomination? So we have a treasurer candidate. So for those joining us online, if you are interested and if you are looking for writing candidates, we did just get an acceptance. Uh, Linda Whitaker for the position of uh, treasurer as a nominee. And for everyone uh, in the audience here, please, uh, we just will have a poll going out here now. So please, uh, if you're online, commit and complete that poll. We'll give you about two minutes. And if you're joining us in person, Shelly is walking through the uh, aisles right now with the ballot box. Thanks, everyone, for participating. We'll do the tally and results will come later. We'll be returning those, vote, uh, those poll results to you at the end of today's meeting, at which time we will then we close out the current officer slate and welcome in the new candidates, uh, new your new officers for the new fiscal year 2024. In the meanwhile, though, I'm happy to jump over to the director's report and to provide you with an overview of just the accomplishments, the challenges, and the vision of where we're looking ahead to from the efforts of this past year. Now, there are a number of ways we can tackle this and to address uh, the full scope of what AJS has done, because as Linda said, it has been a busy year of accomplishments. We have from new exhibits, to new education programs, new partners, and new opportunities, uh, to just even the simple bits of revising our strategic vision so that when we look ahead, we have a stronger path forward. And all this has been accomplished through the support of you, our members, uh, my board, and of course, our staff. And to get things started, I would actually ask, staff, would you all like to rise here and stand just to be recognized for all you've done across the last year? You all appreciate it. And if you haven't had a chance already, please do. Everyone else here, get a chance to talk to our staff afterwards in the reception. Great conversations, and you'll probably learn more about the agency than you ever knew or wanted to know at the time. They are our best agents and best representatives, best investors. So looking ahead here, uh, this past year, we've seen a tremendous bit of recovering growth. Uh, you probably heard in the past the conversations that try to reference to 2020. And well, we have not yet put it behind us, but we are certainly starting to put some distance, is what I can say there. Our numbers are growing, even with the fact that one of our facilities has been closed, still as we work on addressing other issues with the state, we are still seeing a return of people and visitors through programs, through just general initiative, and through the unique services that we provide. So up right now, we are up uh, by a total of 10,000 visitors from last year's numbers. That is a tremendous increase. Uh, acquisitions, we have 85,000 3D objects scattered across our four locations. Uh, those are just one fraction we saw here today. We have over 1.2 million uh, archives spread across the state, which means that we are able to serve researchers, students, uh, professionals, educators with the direct sources that tested, testify to Arizona's history. So how unique, how stand out this state is but not only its own internal history, what it's meant to the nation and the great republic. This is an important statement. We collect its history, your history. And that right there is an important number to show just how committed we are to it. We have new collections coming up down the line to look at as well. In terms of researchers, that is an even stronger program. We now, this year, we're seeing that the online referrals are way up. We've actually inverted these numbers from where we were 10 years ago. Uh, In-persons are about 1,000. And uh, we are seeing, as I said, the online teams and resources, which means it's not just into physically able to get to us, but that Arizona's history now is truly global in its reach. 
Those are big gains, and that's some of the things we're starting to work towards. And then finally, just to pick another number here, MHD. 47 students this year went to Washington, D.C. to represent this state and its history. And of that, we had four separate proposals, I'm sorry, six separate proposals that ended up either in the Smithsonian or the White House testifying across a national competition. And it was Arizona that came out first. Absolutely. If you are interested in hearing more about that story and the trip of Tyler EHS and Shepard, an entire bunch of high schoolers and middle schoolers out to Washington, D.C., Allison's right over there to tell you all about it. And just to show you a few of our numbers right here, you can see where that was, where we came from in terms of that. There we are. You can see our previous growth. Right over here to this current, and you can see that growth over that recovery is taking place. Now we are shifting ourselves. We are seeing that the model is changing. It's not just a mission based anymore. We call it I call it visitation because there are so many more ways to engage in the museum than just walking around and seeing an exhibit. It's the conversations you have, the programs we offer, the content and the quality, the enhancements of that local life and that civic discourse. So we incorporate all those here now, and that's what we're seeing those numbers reflect. And then finally, looking elsewhere, collections, our growth is significant. We are still saying yes. We don't say no to Arizona's history. We don't want to see it lost or uh, in danger. So we are looking at even more in the future, and we are doing the plans right now to accommodate for that, to plan for, well, what happens when we run out of space? Because space is finite. Our solution, we're going to build more. We're going to tell you all about that. In terms of our content, we just kept it rolling this year. And we had five SDR for the virtual speakers, two book talks, six research and presentations across the state. In terms of public events, 10 separate ones, including our now landmark Keystone event, Juneteenth, 600 visitors in one single day with coalition partners from the city of Tempe, CD Phoenix, and across there just to celebrate an important part of Arizona's history. And then finally, new exhibits, seven new exhibits across our state here as well. Uh, including one of which, uh, Rebuilding Home Plate, receiving national awards and recognitions, which actually several of our staff were able to go on out and receive that award and that, uh, you know, looking forward to that. Thing. So if you had a chance to visit it, great, fantastic. If not, don't worry, we're going to keep bringing more ones out here. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to talk to our exhibit uh, exhibits team, and guys, would you just mind raising your hand for the exhibits? All right, we got two in the back right there. That's an accomplishment right there, just itself. Uh, in terms of the exhibits, we have some great new content coming out. So if you would like to hear more, pull one of our staffs here and get that conversation going. Just here alone in Tempe, look forward to the very gold water, Mr. Arizona. That's coming out here. We just last week unveiled a brand new exhibit on the second floor, which I invite you to take a look at, Navajo Runs, and then more to come in the coming months. So it is a busy time for content. If you've seen it once, guarantee you're going to see something different on the next visit. And that's what it's all about getting those backgrounds out to the front to celebrate just how wide and varied Arizona's history is. Really is. In terms of partnerships, we are looking statewide, internal to state government and external, trying to build out that coalition support, just going to make our jobs easier, be it through new additional resources, expertise, professional services, or even just bodies helping us to paper. It all comes down to What's our capacity? And we are seeing that people are hungry for what we offer. They see the unique nature of what we have, and they are hungry for it. Be it for, can we, can we serve as the repository for major architectural collections and archives in the future? To make sure that those historic drawings, original handings of the buildings that built Phoenix, whether those go in the trash, whether or not they're celebrated for the future. And that answer is Arizona Historical Society. The question of who's going to run statewide education to unify the curriculum to get this conversation about what happened before and what stories matter that starts here at arizona historical society we have people approaching us because they recognize that we are emerging as the home for arizona history and that is never looking elsewhere we are seeing development on a whole new level Right now, it's still nascent. We 
brought our own development director for the first time last year, and already in that first year, $185,000 through cash to in kind donations. New partnerships, such as those you're seeing represented here uh, from this meeting, those are coming through, and we're starting to connect now to private as well as the first we, people are seeing the value of history, and they're seeing Arizona Historic Site as the place where that takes place. And then finally, and we're going to give a big shout out to David Toby here with our publications. If you enjoy our journal, it's going to be a new way to move forward from looking ahead with a new company serious to join with the University of Arizona Press. So, any way you look, be it in our building, be it in a classroom where your students and uh, families are, or in that nice package you get every quarter from the Journal of Arizona History. We are telling Arizona's history, its stories, and we are taking it to new levels with the ways we and the people we talk to and those ways. So that is also fantastic. And I appreciate everything that each of you have done, your feedback, your information, your support to get us there. Here's a couple of our photos from the NHD competition itself. And then looking ahead. If you haven't already, we have the QR code. You can scan it and access it on our website. AHS, we've been building not just keep ourselves moving through this new training, but also look ahead further field where we're going. This year, your board of directors approved, after an eight month effort, a new strategic plan to get us through fiscal year 2026 that ad updates and adapts to the realities that were not present when we wrote our last one just coming out of the pandemic in 2021. This is a new vision. It's one that's meant to be reflective of where the state, where the industry is now. And more importantly, what the people of Arizona are hungry for, what we can provide that really is going to elevate this conversation. Uh, we are also looking at our revised budgets, trying to tighten those controls. We put the money, what money we do get, where it matters most. Uh, we've also identified our shortcomings, our limitations. And you know what? This year, we submitted our most honest budget to the state, to the state yet. We calculate a $1.45 million increase that's necessary to keep going to the scale and to the uh, professionalism that you are knowing and seeing us across the state with. That's a big ask. That is a tremendous one. We're going to be working forward with it, looking ahead through the efforts of the strategic plan, through the efforts of our revised budget, and through a new upcoming legislative initiative. Because we need your help on this. This is the call to action. We have the opportunities. We have the stories. We have the proven uh, capacity. But what we need is those legislators to listen. You've heard the challenges we're facing elsewhere in our world. And what we have right now is the same conversation happening with the legislator for our budget. There's so much more we could be doing, so much more that needs to be done. And right now, your staff, we are uh, working as hard as we can to accomplish that. But your support, your efforts to pull that out there to show all these new projects we wanted to, new museum exhibits, new contents, new visions for what history is and how people engage with it. It's not just memorization of facts anymore, because it's no longer closed down the ocean room 1492. It is hands on experience. It is history is a lie. It matters. It's important. And it's through that reflection of the past that we find meaning and value and guidance for the future. And that is what we need your help to make sure we sell as a narrative to get this out here, to show in our state's emissions, when we're asking for a $1.5 million increase, that this is worth funding. Not only that, it's overdue. Many of, you, many of you have been with us for years. You know what we used to be and how big we were. We have shrunk down. We have shadowed ourselves for 10 years ago. And with our 2023, I mean, 2023 Sunset Review, which we just submitted, we know what we could be doing still and where we could grow. So with your support, we can do that. But as you move forward, these talking points, if you'd like to know more, if you can do it, let us know. We would love to work with you because we need all of us. It's all of us together that we make that history for now, for the future. I will happily report, though, for our 2023 sunset, we have completed it. Full credit to everyone in this room, especially staff and board. Took an effort 10 years, but we got through all 20 on all of the 2013 to do's from that last review are finished. We now have an agency that looks and answers what the state needs that meets our statutory requirement and does more than that as well. It goes above and beyond. There's so much that when we were first incorporated over 100 years ago, the state couldn't even begin to think what we could do with that. 
today, where we are now, it is so vital the future conversations. We keep this going, and that's what we need you. And for that, and for both these, please do keep an eye out around that late December mark. We can start reaching out to you. We would love to start out right here. Let's get you out to the down the Capitol, too. Let's show them, of course, just how powerful Arizona history really is. So please keep an eye out for that. And Shelly, just pass around the box through your member communications. So that's where that's going to be coming from. And that's our call to action right here. So please, I'm going to finish my director's note with a positive, but also an ask is we have a capacity, we have a record, and we know what we can accomplish. This is an exciting time for Arizona consumers. More conversations happen now than they have in the past. More agencies, more businesses, more individuals, more schools that see this value, that are hungry for history, that want to know more. But it's with your heart, we're going to be able to really carry this forward and advance it to the way it can give the credit and the attention that it deserves. So please, thank you for the support you've given us. Let's get ready for this next fight. Sound good? Thank you, everyone. With that in mind, I would like to invite David Trippi, our Vice President of Publications and Communications at the stage, to announce the first of our awards. Ms. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, yes, uh, as the editor of the Journal of Arizona History, it is my distinct pleasure to announce the winner of the C.L. Sonicson Award. Since 1987, the Sonicson Award has been given annually to the Journal of Arizona History article from the previous year that was deemed to make the most significant contribution to the study of Arizona history. It is an award that recognizes excellence. And to my mind, the article that our judges chose as the winner of the 2022 Sonicson Award is a model of excellence in historical research and writing. I'm pleased to be able to recognize William F. Stoudemire, for his article, which appeared in the summer 2022 issue of the journal, every year posted a matate, pot hunting, archaeology, and the creation of the Museum of Northern Arizona. Dr. Stoudemire is now an assistant professor of history at the University of Nebraska at Barney, uh, and he is not able to join us here today. He's actually at a, a history conference in Texas. He wanted to be here, but uh, so he sent in a, a short video that we'll put it out. Hello, everyone. Thank you to the Arizona Historical Society for honoring my recent article in the Journal of Arizona History, Every Yard Boasted a Matate, Pot Hunting Archaeology and the Creation of the Museum of Northern Arizona with the Sonicson Award. While I cannot be there with you today, I hope you all know how meaningful it is for my work to receive this recognition. This article is but one part in a larger project on the relationship between the settler community of Flagstaff and Northern Arizona's natural and cultural resources. With my research, I examine how archaeology, museums, and ultimately the American Antiquities Act embraced colonialist rhetoric to encourage the preservation of southwestern pueblos, cliff dwellings, and geological wonders. I aim to ask important questions about the motives of early preservation advocates in order to better understand our contemporary debates over the protection of cultural sites throughout the southwest. No article is written in a vacuum. My thanks to the Journal of Arizona History's editors, David Turpey and Laura Key for their encouragement and guidance, to Gwen Gallenstein and Bob Spoody of the National Park Service for reviewing early drafts of this work, and to my many incredible mentors over the last 10 years, including Nancy Dillette, Dwight Caithley, and the late Jan Warren Finley for their edits, suggestions, and support. Lastly, a huge thanks to my fiance, Laura Jensen, for everything that she does. Thank you all again for this honor, and I hope you have a wonderful annual meeting. All right, and with that in mind, we are ready to move forward to our next section here, which is, of course, going to be our look and review at the 50th anniversary of the El Merida Awards. This is a landmark program, which we're very excited to see its continuation and such a big anniversary coming up. So with that in mind, I'd like to invite several members up to the stage here from Laura Ford and from staff. So please join us up here, Sherry Randy, Kelly Orsett, and Shelly Hi, everyone. I'm Sherry Randy. I am the um, chair of the Advocacy and Outreach Committee on, on for the Arizona Historical Society, and I'm a board member. And I will say, um, in 30 years, I've been doing historic preservation um, work and advocacy for 30 years, and this is the best position 
ever um, because it's the happy news. I get to read um, the applications for El Merito and in doing so, and El Merito is so important um, because I get to read the good work that people do and see what they do. And it's important for us to honor these people because not just honoring them, but learning through their example. And we actually kind of pull knowledge, but also passion from their passions. And in doing so, I think we become better people ourselves and move forward and paying it forward. Um, and so with that, I am very honored to be able to um, to give these awards, uh, present these awards today. Thank you. Um, and, and now Kelly Corset <laughs> will um, do some quotes from, uh, from past awardees. Thank you very much, Sherry. You can tell we rehearsed this uh, ceaselessly. Okay. Um, thank you, David. Okay, so I'm Kelly Corset. I'm an, also an AHS board member. Um, I'm a fifth generation Arizona, and I'm very honored to have just a few minutes today as part of this wonderful presentation for the Almerito on this, its 50th anniversary. Um, you know, if you've been doing something for 50 years, it says a lot about its merit. Almerito. Many think of Arizona history as places or events or even our beautiful natural environment, but we know that it's the people that have made our places and our events memorable. That is what is so meaningful about the El Merito. It's our way of honoring those people from among the millions of people who have called Arizona home throughout our state's history, who have given of themselves so that the stories of other Arizona people would be heard and would be remembered. Over its history, El Merito nominees and honorees have, of course, been memorable people in their own rights. But people who are devoted to history rarely document or tell their own stories. They focus on others. Many people have earned the El Merito across its 50 years, and you may know some of them. We're honored to have our newest El Merito winners, many of them here today. Uh, as we prepare to honor them, I'd like to shine a little bit of light on previous winners over the past five decades. Who are they? Though we can only mention a few here, I think you'll see that they represent some of the best of Arizona. AHS is proud to be associated with all of them. There are people like Gail Gardner, a poet, folklorist, and cowboy singer from Prescott, who was among the first Almerito honorees in 1973. He left quite an impression, his face weathered by decades in the Arizona sun, with an ever-present grin. On the occasion of his award, he said this. Oh, you're beating me to the punch, David. I can't think of anything that would qualify me for any award, except maybe staying out of politics and out of jail for 81 years. Sage words, Linda, we need to stay out of politics. Jail, well, we'll see what happens there. Thelma Kikeffer won the Almerito also in 1973, and in typical fashion of Almerito winners, she took the occasion of her award not to reflect on her own accomplishments, but rather to appreciate the work of others. She was honored for her efforts to collect and make available to the public the art of the American West, but she was more happy about the work that had been done at Tucson's historic Fremont Santa House, where the inaugural Almerito event took place. I was thrilled, pleased, and honored to receive the Almerito Award from your society, she said. The Fremont House patio certainly added to the pleasure. What an undertaking. But how wonderful to see the house become alive again. It must have been a tremendous project and at times must have seemed insurmountable, but now a job well done. Cloud Klein was honored with an Almerito Award in 1976 for a lifetime of service that included championing the creation of Northern Arizona University, desegregating schools, 
and improving relations with American Indian tribes, after which he started a second act, authoring history books about Flagstaff and NAU, among other undertakings. An Arizona Daily Sun article published in 2001 after the man known as Mr. Flagstaff passed away at age 90 contained an insightful anecdote into the character of an Al Marito honoree. Klein was the editor, publisher, and eventually president of the paper, and even after he retired, he was known to frequent the newsroom wearing old slacks and comfortable shoes. Once, the managing editor observed Platt being waved over to a desk by a new reporter, and later, the editor asked what had happened. Platt told him, your new reporter thought I was the janitor. So, of course, I emptied her trash. Dr. Bernard Barney Fontana was a cultural anthropologist, field researcher, archaeologist, historian, author, and co founder of Patronato San Javier, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the restoration of Mission San Javier del Bac. He earned the El Marito in 2014. Among his many works, he devoted 10 years painstakingly cataloging the Christian art at the mission, along with photographer Edward McCain. His thought on that project can be applied to all of the work that has been honored by the Almerito Award over the last 50 years. What I'm hoping, he said, is it'll awaken other people that we have a real treasure here that transcends place. And finally, Janine Trevilian was awarded the El Marito in 2019. Her nominator called her the go-to person for the community and beyond for Sedona's history. On the occasion of receiving her award, she said simply, it is a gift to learn and to be an ambassador for Sedona's past, our history makers, and our historic places. In their words, we see the traits of Arizona's history keepers. Not just the few we named here, but all who have earned this award. Humble, hardworking, at times self-effacing, and dedicated to something greater than themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we um, have the honor of having several El Marito honorees um, uh, in our audience and online. So if you are in the audience, um, if you're online, you don't have to, but welcome to stand up as well. But if you are in the audience, will you please stand up? And um, so we can so we can thank you again. So we have Arizona Contractor and Community Magazine um, here represented by Douglas Town. They won in 2022. Um, Thomas Foster in uh, 2021. Um, I will also say Tom is actually a, a, a past chair of the Advocacy and Outreach Committee and has been amazingly helpful for me. So thank you also for that. Superstition Mountain uh, Historical Society, um, Jane Skyle and Greg Davis, they um, received in 2020. Are here. Uh, uh, Janine uh, Trevelyan. Uh, she was awarded in 2019. Thank you. John Lacey, um, here from 2009, who's received the award. Vic Winoff, um, in 2006, received the award. Thank you. Um, Melvin Van Gorst, 2005. And finally, the Yuma County Historical Society, Bruce Wynn in 1974. And Bruce is still on our board. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. And now um, we will move forward to the, um, we're going to move forward to the team um, awardees. Uh, our first one is the, Okay, is the Navajo County Historical um, Society, and okay, here we are. And uh, Navajo County Historical Society. I believe that we have Sherry Reed um, on Zoom with us. 
I, uh, I will say also, um, so in reviewing these nominations, I will just tell you a little bit of what um, was so meaningful to um, our committee. But this one was amazing in how the um, application, the nomination was written in that um, basically we were told that a group of a very small group of four, four women headed by Sherry, um, they from the um, Navajo County Courthouse Museum and Visitor Center, there is only one part-time employee and it is through their volunteer hours and their and their spirit that they do this. In 2022, they had over 15,000 visitors come through, and there are and there's no fee to um, to go. They have I I might be lying on this, but they have like eight or nine um, an eight or nine room museum and a jail and the visitor center. So really, they're in inspiring group of volunteers of what can be done with commitment and um, and determination. So thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sherry Reed. I'm the director of the Navajo County Historical Society. We are both humbled and honored to accept this El Morito Award. The success of the museum goes to our board of directors, employees, and many volunteers. I would also like to thank the Navajo County government and the city of Hobart for their ongoing support in helping us preserve our local and state histories for generations to come. And again, on behalf of the Historical Society and Museum, I thank you. This next, um, this next award goes to um, Frank Barrios. When I was writing uh, little tidbits for each one of these, I found this one to be the most difficult because I don't know how you can take such an extraordinary amount of work and commitment and just this, this huge, somebody that left um, just this huge legacy and he recently passed and to, to say, there's so much to say. Um, he was a historian. He was a human, humanitarian. In reading his many, um, many works, he did, um, there are groups that we didn't even really know about, stemming from first families. He went, um, he did, uh, a little notes. Um, first family did a lot of work with St. Vincent de Paul, the Kino Border Initiative. Um, and he was also part of First Families of Arizona. Um, he also wrote two books, one of which Mexicans in Phoenix. And he was probably, unfortunately, I didn't have the honor of meeting him, but I know it would have been a pleasure and an honor because I have yet to meet anybody that did not adore the man. And he was um, humble and, and just quite amazing. So um, uh, here to accept his award, um, is a, a friend of his as well. So she'll say a few words. This is, um, sorry, Arizona. The awards this year are absolutely beautiful, aren't they? Um, Frank was a great friend of the Historical League and the Historical Society. He was on the Central, he was on the Central Arizona Board. Um, as well as being a great friend to the historical league, he supported our events always and a friend of the society. Another thing that Frank did was the Pioneer Cemetery, making sure that that was taken care of. Fortunately, Frank knew about two weeks before he died on September 11th that he was going to receive the Alamerto Award and he was very grateful for that. Um, he was an awesome human being. He took photographs, hiked and hunted early on, he said, and then he learned to, to um, just take the pictures. But his photographs are phenomenal and he's donated, I think, most of those to the Historical Society and they will be available for people to see at some point in time. 
very grateful that he's received this. Thank you. Now the the next award goes to um, yes, Dr. Michael Bush. And what I found, um, and he is on. Okay, so we have a video um, as well from him. He is actually um, at uh, U of A. He's a professor at a, uh, U of A. Um, since 2002, he is an amazing body of work um, as far as writings and, um, well, writings and, um, and research and whatnot. He's not here to join us today, and he had a personal invitation. He's not able to um, join us today. But um, the thing that was really interesting um, within the uh, nomination for him is that he, his work, his most striking work, comes from water rights relating to the Hopi and Navajo nations in northern Arizona. And so I found it very um, pertinent in today's, uh, you know, to make today's political climate or our climate climate, but um, but a further proof that history is always relevant. So, um, so it goes to um, Dr. Michael Brush. Greetings to my friends and colleagues and fellow members of the Arizona Historical Society. I am attending this year's annual meeting via Zoom, but the organizers and I agreed that for purposes of higher quality audio, it would be better to video record my brief remarks. Please know how honored and humbled I am to be a recipient of this year's Al Medito Award, especially in this 50th anniversary year. I wanna thank my dear friend, Beth Grindel, former director of the Arizona State Museum, for writing such a supportive and persuasive nomination. Under Beth's leadership, I was encouraged to promote the multicultural dimensions of Arizona history and borderlands history beyond the traditional classroom. And speaking of the Arizona State Museum, the oldest and largest anthropology museum in the Southwest, the leadership there, as well as my colleagues, have given this historian plenty of support to conduct his research, teach his classes, and develop public outreach initiatives. A sincere acknowledgement also goes out to the members of the Arizona Historical Society's Outreach Committee for their hard work in evaluating what I'm told was a competitive applicant pool, which makes the award that much sweeter and meaningful. I wanna thank my dear family, my wife Alejandra, and our daughter Karina for their love and support and also for accompanying me up and down Arizona, across the Southwest in Mexico, and even to Europe, as I try to identify and recover the many historical and cultural threads that allow us to better understand the complexities of Arizona's rich history. In fact, I am recording this message from Princeton University, where I am a visiting professor. And here, my students are reading about and researching the legacies of Spanish and Mexican law in Arizona and throughout the North American West. Finally, I wanna give a shout out to my friend, David Turpey, editor of the Journal of Arizona History, for all his strong efforts to add scholarly heft to the journal while simultaneously ensuring that the articles remain accessible to the society's membership and the general public. Finally, I never tire in acknowledging the good work of my former students, especially Janie Adams, the History Engagement Coordinator at the Arizona History Museum. Janie's passion for Arizona history is evident in the way our students and the public respond to her outreach programs. Again, thank you so much for giving me this high honor, the Almedito Award. Enjoy the rest of the annual meeting, and I look forward to seeing you all next year in person. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. And um, the, the next award is um, this one moved me all, almost to tears, quite honestly. It was, um, this is a prime example of 
of taking something that is so painful within somebody's life and transferring it into something beautiful. In the 1970s, um, a, an entire neighborhood was uh, destroyed um, for the airport expansion influence. Um, 6,000 um, families were scattered, and, and that's exactly what they were scattered. They lost their neighborhood. Um, and then through COVID in 2020, um, Arizona Barrio stories came up. Um, this was started uh, as, on, as online and um, by the gentleman coming up, Gil Bevins, um, and they now have over 29,000 people um, that have connected. So I would um, love to welcome them up here to speak about this, but to me, it was something negative that happened, that story is told, it's something incredible, and people can make it. So thank you very much. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is an honor uh, to be here today. Uh, with such an elite group, I was looking at the history makers uh, in the hallway, and I know a good majority of them, Jay Snell, uh, Rose Castro, um, Rose Mofford, and what uh, what an elite group and an honor to share uh, these moments with them. I had no idea that my life was gonna was gonna be lead me to here our entire team. I'd like to just take a few minutes and introduce uh, this elite team, and I'll tell you a quick story that you will be able to appreciate and relate to. This is my wife, Joanne. She's been with me from the beginning on this project, Endless Nights. This is uh, Irma Payan. She's our host of uh, a, uh, our community archivist, and I call her our historian, although she doesn't. Uh, she's a uh, retired teacher. Uh, 32 years and also went on to become uh, one of the community archivists for Arizona State University and then we robbed her from ASU. <laughs> and then we have Ray uh, Martinez uh, who is also part of our team. Uh, he is also uh, has been a political, he has been a major influence and we're all natives of the state of Arizona in our barrios. Um, we have exactly 33,938 members on our platform. So I'm gonna start from the front and work myself back as to what, what inspired the project. We have about 250,000 viewers per month on our platform. Uh, all uh, educators, historians, <clears throat> philanthropists, people who grew up in the barrios, in the neighborhoods. My story began in the very same neighborhood that Sally was talking about, we were wiped out by the airport. Uh, imminent domain, correct? We were forced from a community and had no idea that we were being forced to move. Um, what influenced this project was when I was eight years old, uh, I was the top producer for Arizona Republican Gazette. That is where my newspaper career started. And I did it for five years. If you remember the Arizona Republican Gazette, on uh, the park that they have on 48th Street in Indian School, that was that was our out to leave the neighborhood. Uh, we were uh, we were isolated in an area that uh, the one of the things that's common is we were we were poor but we didn't know it right. So that was our community from the age of eight eight years old to 13, which puts us at 1975, I was the little kid that was knocking on your door, asking for a collect. The, remember those little square receipts? I used to put those all in my pocket and Arizona Republican Gazette loved me because I was a top producer. And I think my collect my collection at the time was $10 a week. And, uh, and that, was a, that was super. Um, the, um, on the weekends, uh, during this time, I met, I knew everybody in the block, Mrs. Martinez, Mrs. Hernandez. I knew who was ill. I knew the neighbors. I had a conversation. I I left my house at 3.30, and I wouldn't come home till 9 o'clock for my bike route, right? My mom would say, where are you? What, what, what's taking you so long? 
And I, I just used to love hearing the stories of everyone that I collect. Everyone had a story. Hey, Gil, how are you? How was your day at school today? And, you know, we would, get, we would start the conversation, and then I would go to the next door, and then we could start. So in five years, these neighbors had become my family. I knew absolutely everybody. I knew the dog's name. I knew the cat's name. I knew what door. I knew exactly where they were going to leave my money. And on Christmas Day, I was the first one knocking on their door. <laughs> but in any case, um, in 1976, uh, um, my heart was broken. We got a letter from the city of Phoenix advising us that we, we were being forced to move. And mind you that these were the streets that we grew up in. These, this was a community where all of our friends would, uh, would gather and we would have a lot. We had a corner store. We had, we had a baseball field right across the street. And, uh, and this is where, uh, this is where all of us connected. This was our childhood story. When we were forced out of the community, um, we adapted to that. But one of the things that struck me further in, in my life, it was the sad news of me not being able to take my kids to the community that I grew up with, to the community that molded me, to the communities that made me who I am today, my Mexican, my Mexican roots. And so we started to, my thoughts, uh, my thoughts inspired me to make sure that those empty lots weren't forgotten about. Many communities have vanished and we have written over 200 stories today about those empty lots of families that used to thrive there at one time. Um, these individuals um, have become philanthropists, have become doctors, have become police officers, have become educators. Uh, Ray Martinez was in House Representatives, uh, former Deputy Director for the Department of Correction. We all came from those neighborhoods. And, uh, and we're happy to be standing here to tell the story, to make sure that our kids remember where their parents came from and where we, where we began and what molded them. So for that reason, we're going to continue telling stories. Uh, we are humbled with this award. Thank you so much, Arizona Historical Society. We appreciate it. We're going to continue to, to, to build stories. And uh, I would encourage you to connect to Arizona Barrio Stories on Facebook. Um, I would encourage you to connect with us on LinkedIn on Arizona Barrio Stories. You will see people that you know on there. We have, we have, uh, community leaders that you would be surprised where they came from. And uh, we produce about three or four, show, three shows a week. They're 13 minute storytelling shows and they will share the journey with you. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. We are now at the highlight uh, featured speaker presentation. I'd like to call David Turpy up to introduce this year's featured speaker uh, for our 2023 annual meeting. David Turpy. All right, hello again. Um, I'm incredibly honored to introduce our keynote speaker today. Born and raised in the Phoenix area, Eduardo Pagan began his college career at Mesa Community College. He then received a bachelor's degree from Arizona State University, a master's degree from the University of Arizona, and a master's degree and doctorate in US history from Princeton University. He is now the Bob Stump Endowed Professor of History at Arizona State University. At ASU, he has also served as a vice provost, associate dean, department chair, president of the West Campus Faculty Senate, and is the faculty council chair of the Arizona Board of Regents. Dr. Pagan was also one of the hosts of the television show History Detectives on PBS, a historical consultant with the American Experience series on PBS, and has appeared in national and international documentaries and television shows. His most recent book is Valley of the Guns, The Pleasant Valley War, and the Trauma of Violence, which was published by the University of Oklahoma Press in 2018. He is also the author of Murder at the Sleepy Lagoon, Zoot Suits, Race and Riot in Wartime LA, which was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2003. He has published in a number of scholarly journals, 
including our very own journal of Arizona history. In addition, Dr. Bagan has authored the book, Historic Photos of Phoenix, which was reissued as a paperback uh, called Remembering Phoenix. At ASU, Dr. Bagan teaches a number of history courses, including among others, the Bill of Rights and the US Supreme Court, the Hispanic Southwest and historical method methods. Uh, and we are very fortunate to have Dr. Fergon here today uh, to present his talk, Georgie Clifford and the Dark Underside of the Old West. So please uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Eduardo Fergon. Thank you so much, David. Um, I'm so honored to be among you, uh, whom I consider my tribe, uh, those who love history, those who love Arizona history as well. Uh, and I especially want to just give a shout out to those who are involved with preservation work. You don't do enough in Arizona. And so I'm grateful for the work that you do in preserving our history also. So what I thought I would share with, with you, um, David has warned me that I've got a half hour. Um, and for a professor and a stage and a mic, this is a dangerous situation. I'm, I'm trained to lecture for 75 minutes, so I will do my best to keep this uh, within that time slot. Uh, but what I thought I would share with you is this latest project that I'm writing on in, in Arizona history. It's really the story of Georgie Clifford. If you don't know who she is, I'll introduce you to her in just a moment. These are the things I'd like to cover very quickly. So I realize it's about four and a half minutes each. So as I said, I will do my best. I want to just mention very briefly how I came to be interested in this particular topic. And this really got me into exploring the drug culture of the Arizona Territory. I was very surprised by what I found. Uh, well, narcotics, which I'm sure many of you know about, but I don't think I knew enough about this going into this, uh, which then uh, helps me explore the drug culture of the Arizona Territory. And then the, uh, the story of Georgie Clifford. Georgie Clifford was herself addicted to morphine she also used heroin. She also used cocaine. Um, she was also a prostitute, and she was trafficked as a result. Um, so in other words, uh, her addiction was used to control her by various, uh, by various parties as well. So I think I am safe in using the term trafficking uh, because she was being controlled in that particular way. But here's the most important part for me is really the implications for the study not only of Arizona, but also the American West from all of this that I found. So this is how I came to be interested in this topic as I was doing research for the book Valley of the Guns, and this is on the Pleasant Valley War. Um, I was doing research actually down in Phoenix at the Rose, uh, the Polly Rosenblum uh, archives, flipping through the records of the Yuma Territory Prison. So I was just trying to find out what, what had become the, of some of the people that I was writing about. And they came across prisoner 947, Georgie Clifford. And right away, as you can imagine, this afternoon I'm sitting at the microfilm reels. This image just jumped out of me. I don't know if you've had this happen before, but it, it just grabbed me. Uh, one of the things I want to point out about this uh, to begin with is that she was 20 years old. So this is the age of my students. So right away, I'm asking questions. What is she doing? in a prison facility that was made for men, right? And these are the worst kinds. These are murderers, arsonists, and so forth, rapists. What was she doing there? What got her there? But as I looked at this picture and kind of pondered this question, I don't know if you can make this out, but if you notice around her eyes, it's darkened. In fact, um, again, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm reading too much into this, but uh, even around her nose, yes, that shadowing is going on, but what I saw in this image was that she'd been crying her eyes out. She probably hadn't slept the night before. This is the worst thing you can imagine. And again, the question is, what was this woman doing at this place at this particular time? Let me just add one other thing as well. Because of the shadow, you can't tell her hair is pulled back and left. It's not short. But that's really what started me down this quest. I was just curious, why did this woman end up where she ended up? What was it that, uh, that drove there? So this is the actual register. And this is the line uh, that caught my attention right here. So going down, I, maybe you can read this. Um, over here under uh, scars and deformities, uh, small scar on the left side of mouth. And this is it right here. Syringe marks on both legs. 
So right away, I began to understand that she was addicted to some sort of substance that she was injecting on a regular basis. So this really got me into really exploring the context of her life. Now, the time that we're talking about when she was uh, placed in the Yuma Territory Prison was 1894, to give you a sense of this. So here's the backstory very quickly. And I, again, I'm trying to be mindful. I had a friend one time that said, never ask a historian what time it is. They'll tell you how to build a watch, right? And so I'm trying not to go that deep. But the point is, is that, you know, so often when we think about opium, and I will get to opiates in just a moment. We think about opium, we think about the Chinese workers that came across and were on the West Coast. Um, yes, that's true, but here's what's interesting. Opium is not native to China. It doesn't grow in China. So here's a very quick uh, part of the backstory. It's a very strange story about the global opium trade. These are the regions where opium naturally grows. India, Afghanistan, parts of Turkey as well. Uh, this is what makes it interesting. This map in the dark maroon colors, and out there is on the state university, the dark maroon colors, these are the areas of the uh, British Empire at its height. So if you will notice, then, in terms of the open growing areas, this is where England lay claim to the opium growing areas. What happened was uh, England found itself in a trade deficit with China. Silks, peas, uh, it was a fairly significant deficit. And there were those planners of the empire that realized that if they could export opium to China, they could then address the trade imbalance. In fact, there's some estimates that would place the significance of opium exports abroad, primarily to China, to about 20% of the revenue that the crown was, was enjoying in that, that time period. England actually went to war twice. The opium wars. Uh, China resisted as much as it could uh, the importation of of opium, and several Americans were involved in uh, bootleg opium as well, smuggling in, into the country. Some prominent American fortunes were built off of this bootlegging or this smuggling as well. But opium, or the England went to war twice, and this is one of the reasons why the UK wound up with Singapore. And some of the other positions, positions. This is a, an illustration uh, that represents Lord Palmer, Palmerston. You see opium in the background, cramming it down the throat of a, a Chinese individual. And this is representing basically what England did during this period. The outcome of these two wars were this, that England forced China to accept opium imports. And so doing it, we've in the the Qing dynasty, China eventually lost its sovereignty. England effectively created a nation of addicts on opium uh, for profit. And Chinese workers brought then brought opium to the United States. So that's how opium came to the United States through Chinese workers. It was something that was foisted upon them first uh, by the UK. Now, in fact, here's one graph uh, to illustrate then the significance. This is opium imports into China. And you see the rapid escalation. And so the, the marks of the opium wars are right here, here as well. Uh, and you see then how much opium then was, was fed into China, just to give you some idea about this. Now, that's opium. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But this is what I found that was significant. This was a period in global history in which narcotics were sold over the counter and completely unregulated. Not one stitch of regulation. We're talking about morphine. We're talking about heroin and also cocaine to name only three of other substances that you could freely uh, purchase either through the mail or through your local druggist or in some fashion. I want to focus only on morphine, heroin, and cocaine. And all of this is setting the story then to the life of Georgie Clifford. That's why I wanted to, to go through so very quickly. So uh, morphine was synthesized by Friedrich Suturner uh, in uh, 1804, and it's an alkaloid that was synthesized from opium. Suturner himself was an insomniac, a chronic insomniac. He recognized that opium had sleep producing qualities and he was hoping to be able to capture that in order to then cure his own uh, insomnia. Interesting thing about, uh, about Suturner, and this was just the nature of, of chemistry, 
uh, in, in that period. He experimented first on frogs and then on neighborhood children and then on himself. Um, and when he survived, who knows, he figured if he had something that could be used, right? But he named this Morphine after Morpheus, the god of dreams, and that's how it, uh, that's how it came about. It was first sold as a cure for insomnia, and then it, by 1827, it became a large-scale commercial product by a pharmacy that eventually became Merck. And they sold it as a treatment for opium and alcohol addiction. I'll give you a moment just to think about that one, just a moment, right? Yes, morphine was first sold as a treatment for addiction to opium and also then uh, for alcohol as well. Now, uh, in the 19th century, for most of the 19th century, morphine was really seen as the wonder drug. This was the drug that cured human suffering. And so you think about it today, many of us have pain from various uh, ailments, chronic pain as well. Morphine was the gift of the gods. That was actually one of the phrases that was given to morphine. It was the gift of the gods. It was the ability then to really conquer pain. Now, uh, it was used widely uh, during the American Civil War. There are debates going on now among scholars about how many people were actually uh, uh, addicted to morphine or not. The high number is about 400,000 soldiers coming back. I just want to note that usage is not the same as addiction. I'm aware of that, uh, but addiction does not come unless there is usage first. So we know that it was used very, very widely as a pain reliever, and some of them certainly became addicted. Again, was it that high number or not? There's one. Let's move on to heroin. Heroin was then synthesized from morphine as a cure for morphine addiction. Right, David? This is absolutely true. As it turns out, it was one and a half to two times more powerful than morphine. It was named heroin to begin with because after the subjects were then injected with this substance, you know, of course, a good doctor would ask, well, how do you feel now? And the answer was, I feel like a hero. I can take on the world. And hence the name heroin was given to, to this alkaloid. And then it was brought to market by Bayer in 1898. There's a picture right there. So before Bayer was known for aspirin, it was actually known for, for heroin. Um, so now, over-the-counter drugs. So morphine, in time, the side effects of morphine became well, well known. It was a popular rec recreational drug. As I mentioned before, uh, Bayer marketed heroin as a non-addictive morphine substitute. And of course, heroin had one of the highest rates of addiction among its users. Um, now, the last thing I want to mention is very quickly, cocaine. Cocaine does not come from opium. It actually comes from the uh, ethroxylin coca leaf. It had been used by a native of South America since before contact. We don't know how far back it goes back, but it reduces swelling, promotes energy as well. And then cocaine was then synthesized as a cocaine alkaloid in 1855. And initially, European researchers used it as an anesthesia and also as a stimulant as well. Here's why I'm bringing this to your attention. It was, again, it was over the counter and it was used in virtually every form, liquid, powder. Um, you, could, you could buy any number of substances that were infused with cocaine. So cocaine infused cigarettes were very popular. Um, you could use it in just about every form possible. In fact, it was even uh, going beyond the 19th century. Shackleton and Scott and their expedition to South Pole used cocaine pills. Uh, it was among the pet pills as well. It wasn't the one, but it was among the different pet pills. Um, the picture that I have here, and this is what's rather interesting, is, is diving deep into the culture of the 19th century. The glitter world, right? So in other words, the elite of the 19th century. Uh, how do I say this? Uh, gleefully imbibed and used cocaine and morphine and heroin, and it was completely normal, it was completely accepted, um, and it was just a part of society. So the elite used it widely, um, as did uh, the working class as well. Now let's talk more specifically about the Arizona territory now. So I'm trying to give you a global backstory so you understand the contents. Now what's happening in the Arizona territory? Um, for me, to focus in on the Arizona ter territory is significant, not simply because we live here, but what makes the Arizona uh, Territory unique is that 
this was an, a land that was sparsely populated at first and even more sparsely populated by any med trained medical professionals to begin with. Many people had to doctor themselves. This was a period, as we were thinking about the mid to late 19th century, this was also a period in which to become a doctor, you didn't necessarily need to have a degree. You just had to apprentice with a doctor, and then you could hang out in your shingle and call yourself a doctor. In fact, that happened quite a bit. Um, as you can imagine, a lot of mistakes happen. But it, the, the fact that there were so many people that needed to self-medicate and, and self uh, uh, practice self-care because of the lack of reliable access to, to medicine, it makes the Arizona Territory rather interesting. I'll show you an example in just a moment, but I want to talk a little bit about the culture of opiate consumption. To begin with, opium. Opium was perhaps the most communal of all the experiences. So you remember the picture that I showed you earlier in an opium den. Uh, in fact, let me show you this. This is a map of downtown Prescott. You recognize this is now Whiskey Row. This is Montezuma, though, right? And so the courthouse is just right over there. On the other side, Granite Street is still there, uh, probably about halfway up. And this map, this is an 1890 map. Uh, it is now a parking lot. But this, this area at one time, this is where, this was the red light district. But along the red light district also were a number of Chinese uh, facilities. We'll just call it them. Some of them were, were laundries, but this is where the opium dens were as well. So in the territorial capital, over here was the law, was the courthouse. Over here was, was the red light district. And in this red light district were a number of opium dens. And you would find that anywhere from Clifton to Phoenix to Tucson, up to Williams, across to, to the uh, five Town as well. This is very, very common. In the red light district, you were often flying opium as well. They were operating in the open. In fact, opium was so accepted that there were boosters in the early 19th century, the er early Arizona period, that were encouraging the growth of opium along the Colorado River or along the Santa Cruz River. This is one uh, editorial that was published in the Arizona Minor, 1866. It was advocating for Arizona to become the chief opium grower in the nation. And you'll see the rationale right here. To the luxuriant soil, the matchless climate of Arizona, its mineral wealth to the projected overland railroad and to the geographical position at the head of the Gal California Gulf on the borders of one of the most valuable of Mexican provinces, nothing is wanting but a suitable staple to rise this territory speedily to a state. The miracle, King Cotton in his time operated the, the quantum, quantum slave states, why he might be excelled by Queen Opium, getting to Arizona, and the Pacific states greater commercial and political power than the cotton states will ever free. So at one time, there were boosters and investors that were very interested in making Arizona the opium growing capital of the nation. Now, ultimately, they did not succeed, but there was a lot of talk about it. And what this does, then, it kind of paints on the acceptability of opium and opiates, the derivatives of opium widely accepted, widely used as well, to the extent that people are, are openly acknowledged we can make a lot of money off of this, right? All right, now, morphine, as we're talking about the cultures, I said opium uh, smoking was perhaps the most communal of activities. I want to say one last thing about this as well. Because of its communal nature, this was eventually used towards the end of the 19th century to argue for closing down opium dens because whites and Asians were mixing promiscuously, as the phrase was. They weren't actually doing anything more than laying next to each other. But nonetheless, these were the times when uh, segregation was between all groups. And the fact that that was not happening in opium dens was sufficient to then galvanize lawmakers to then crack down on opium dens. Let me add one other thing as well. You're all familiar with the term hipster and hippie. It actually comes from opium smoking because often you would lie on your side, right, when you would smoke opium, and from that we get the term hipster. It used to refer to someone who then uh, consumed opium, or from hipster then comes hippie as well. So now morphine was much more solitary. And as I mentioned before, you could go to any druggist, even if your druggist in town didn't have morphine that you could purchase, you could, you could uh, purchase it through mail order. And that was a much more solitary experience uh, 
there are some examples of, of morphine users who would pair up with one another just to keep an eye to make sure that they didn't overdose. But it was much, much more solitary to the extent that it is it was not uncommon to read in the newspapers in the late 19th century somebody discovered in the room having an overdose no one was there uh, to take care of them in, in fact and so uh, that's what happened here let me just say one other thing as well the, the thing that made morphine so powerful during this period was actually the discovery of the subcutaneous uh, needle in other words the ability to to then put uh, morphine directly in your bloodstream uh it was used before uh, 1857, if I remember the Drake correctly, don't quote me on that. Uh, but before that, morphine could be consumed uh, through liquids. So you're familiar with water, wine, and, and morphine as well. The problem with that is that the intestinal tract is pretty good at filtering out the influence of opium. And so its impact, by the time it had actually gone into your bloodstream, was actually uh, less than quite, quite a bit. But when you shot it directly into your bloodstream and it went straight to your brain, that's what gave morphine its power. Last thing I'll say about this, it, this was so common that Sears and Roebuck catalog sold, uh, sold more, uh, syringe kits that came with two vials of morphine. This is how common it was and how accepted it was, right? So again, if the drugist didn't have it, you could just send away to Sears and Roebuck or anywhere else, right? Now, here's the last thing I want to say about cocaine. Some of you already know about this. Cocaine was ubiquitous. It was omnipresent. It was everywhere. You, I'm sure many of you have seen this as well, Mother's Little Helper. These are uh, cocaine drops that were administered to babies who were teething. So the answer back then was to get them high so they would stop crying, right? But I, what, what I'm paying for you, though, is, is that we're talking about a period so I'm going to say from the early 19th century all the way up until the 1920s, when these substances then became controlled by the governments of the world, that people were exposed to opiates or cocaine narcotics from birth all the way forward. It was just natural and normal. And this gets us a little bit to the story of, of Georgie Clinton. She's 20 years old in 1894. Uh, she was a morphine user. As it turns out, in, in digging deep into her life, uh, she had experienced sexual trauma raped by her mother's mother. And what was a common medical practice of this period was to frequently dose women with morphine to take care of what was called the immunization. Whatever something they had, go to the doctor and they would get morphine. So what I'm painting for you is a time in which from birth to adolescence, you are regularly uh, presented with powerful and addictive substances. These were the substances. These were, this was the period uh, in the context of her particular life. Cocaine uh, from my, I don't know if communal is quite the right word, but it was the most openly used substance uh, that existed back then. This right here, is uh, cocaine tablets for hay fever, right? So again, if your nose is running, take cocaine, you'll feel much better. Um, but the list, the list goes on. I mean, many of you know this as well, that, that Coca-Cola, uh, when it first came out, it came out as a response actually to the growing temperance movement. And so the effort was to draw from cola, this is where you get the caffeine, and the coca leaf. And so the original formula for Coca-Cola actually had uh, cocaine right here. It, it says right here, uh, valuable tonic and nerve stimulant properties of the coca plant and cola nut, uh, and makes not only a delicious, exhilarating, refreshing, and invigorating beverage, uh, it goes on and on about all these kinds of things. And so um, this was widely, widely used, so commonly used in cough drops, and as I mentioned before, in cigarettes, it was just everywhere. Cocaine was, again, I, it, it's just mind-blowing to me. Here's the last thing I want to say this about this as well. Many patent medicines coming out of this period, nostrums, um, were highly infused with opiates. Many of them were, right? Now, nostrums, patent medicines, we still use them today, not in this form, but 
you know, I was thinking the other day, so uh, my mother is, is a great believer of Vix, uh, right? Vix comes out of this period, ben, I've used Ben Gay, right? And it's, in other words, Alka-Seltzer also, right? I mean, these are all things that are that are medicinal, but they're not prescriptive medicines. We still use them. We don't call them patent medicines anymore, but this is kind of the, the territory from which this all comes. And so in the mid to late 19th century, there were patent medicines that promised everything. I really kid you not. If, if one, of, one of the things I really enjoy, David and I share this, this passion. I love reading territorial newspapers from start to finish. Because what it does is it gives me an idea of what, what people were thinking about, talking about. But one of the things that you will easily find are advertisements for all kinds of patent medicines that will promise or that did promise the world. And they literally, you know, from sore throats to cancer to, I mean, the list went on and on and on. Use this substance and you'll feel much better. And many of these substances were actually infused. Uh, either with alcohol uh, or opiates or both. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a study, there was a group that existed uh, in the 1890s. Uh, it was called the Society for the Study of, ne of Inebriety. It was a group of medical professionals that had gotten together and they wanted to understand addiction better. So they, they met on a regular basis. They published their journals also. Um, and this is one particular study they did. And over here to the right, I appreciate you may not be able to read this, but what they did is they went and they, they pulled out about 50 of these medicines that are commonly available to try and understand how much alcohol is found in them. And in fact, some of you might remember this. Do you, do you remember uh, Geritol? Yeah, okay. <laughs> do you remember why Geritol was pulled from the, from the, the, the market? Because it was pretty much whiskey. I mean, that's what I understood, right? Um, yeah, and so uh, this this goes through and it, it lists the percentage of, of alcohol that are contained in all of these remedies for addiction. And they were marketed as remedies for alcohol addiction as well. And so this, this group of scientists really tried to expose uh, the false claims that were out there by patent medicines. And I will say this one more time. This is a period when there was, this is before the Pure Food, food and Drug Administration. There was absolutely no regulation at all for any of these substances. You could invent an item like Coca-Cola and begin to market it and buyer beware, right? And these, this was a period that we're talking about. Now, what does this all tell us? A couple of things. One, the global opiate market by the 19th century was no accident, but achieved through a history of intentional efforts by many individuals, by many investors, by corporations and patients as well. And powerfully addictive drugs were cheap, widely available, and used indiscriminately as a cures or for pleasure in the Victorian era, including the era of the Old West. And even addiction cures uh, were laced with opiates as well. So then if you recognize that you had what was called morphomania, for example, in other words, if you recognize you had an addiction problem with morphine and you turn to these patent medicines for help, you would get no help, right? So what I'm trying to paint for you is that if, uh, getting back to the story of Georgie Clifford, the poor woman had no access to getting clean other than culture. Uh, the, the state of, of medicine of the late 19th century did, did, simply did not have the sophistication to understand addiction. We're still wrestling with it right now, but we're still trying to understand it. But in the 19th century, uh, someone like Georgia, if you remember that clean, she certainly did. It was rough, rough, rough. And she wasn't alone. There were many, many others that were using and also uh, addicted to it. Now, here's the last thing I want to share with you in terms of widespread usage. Home remedies. I've mentioned this before. These are some recipes. You can find these in the various territorial newspapers about curing chronic pain, for example. This one comes out of Tucson. It's reprinted in Prescott as well. Uh, the cure, the home cure, was uh, mixed morphine with whiskey. Uh, Phoenix Arrow, cure for diarrhea. Uh, combine a tincture of opium uh, with cayenne pepper, rhubarb, and camphor. <laughs> I have not the guts to try that one. I'll just say that. Uh, Tucson, the Arizona Weekly. Uh, remedy for pneumonia was something that was called Sheep Herders Delight. Some of you know about this. It was basically mixing morphine with hot whiskey. And it was also recommended for treating wounds, all right? Just so you know. Uh, the cure for what was called nervous and bilious 
headaches, migraines, was a mix of cranberry and cannabis, right? So again, this is a period where people self-medicated with what they had and they had everything available to them. We have a question already, yes. Anything, yes, you could probably care for anything and they did. One of the, the curious things is when you read uh, the advertisements for many of these patent medicines, they list every conceivable ache and pain that you can imagine. And you would think that a savvy consumer would go, come on, it can't cure everything from a sore throat to uh, amputation or you know what I'm saying, but they were used, they were sold and they were used. Um, and again, I, this is not to fault anywhere that time period. This is a period when people were trying to find the cure for pain. And if you've ever lived with pain, you understand the lengths that you would go to try and find some remedy, right? It's still, I, I, I share this with you with great sympathy of what this is. Now, what I've done is I've done a, a, a study of narcotic deaths from 1869 to 1892. By the way, David, give me the high sign if I hit when I hit my, my time mark, okay? All right, thank you. Uh, as I said, I could go on. Um, so over here in the blues, overdose, murder, suicide, murder, suicide, and unknown. These are the stories that you find in the territory uh, newspapers that were directly related to opiates or to opium or to cocaine. And what this does is it shows what I would characterize as kind of the outside edge of use and addiction. Not all addicts wound up murdering somebody or committing suicide or overdosing, but it shows you that it happened nonetheless with some frequent, some regularity and some frequency as well. Uh, and in fact, there are periods where we can, when it got even worse uh, as well. So I uh, just want to share with you as well, as we're talking about this picture in this context of the life of Georgia Cooper, uh, David Portwright published Dark Paradise. Uh, and I recommend this. In his study, and he was trying to look at the nation as a whole in the 19th century, he found that the largest percentage of addicts of opiates were women, largely middle-class women, why? It's because it was overprescribed by the medical profession. The second largest percentage of addicts, anyone guess? Oh, you would think children, yes. Doctors, yes, that's true. This is a time period in which doctors self-experimented. Again, if you read the medical journals of the 19th century, even in, in, into the early 20th century, they were not uh, studies of controlled studies like we do today, for example. They were, they were often almost on the level of editorials where doctors would write in and say, I had a woman come in the other day and I gave her two grams of, of opium and she seemed fine afterwards. And this was then recommended to the field or else I tried this and this is what happened to me. So doctors were actually the second largest uh, slice of addicts during this period because they self-medicated, right? Um, so. Back to the story of Georgia Clifford. Um, as I mentioned before, um, she was a young woman who uh, grew up in Clifton, Arizona. Um, and as a result, as I mentioned before, of, of sexual trauma, she was then treated for trauma. There's evidence that she was, in fact, treated for this trauma with morphine. And from there, it kind of started her life of addiction all the way down. And then as things developed, she then turned to the sex trade as a way of feeding her addiction, and then it was used against her. She was controlled by various Johns and pimps uh, to the extent where she wound up in the territorial prison for manslaughter. She was accused of overdosing a client, and this is something else that I found out as well. Um, I didn't realize that in many of the, the houses of prostitution, there, not only were they fully stocked with all the the finest spirits that you could find, all the work with the whiskey and alcohol that you wanted, but they were well stocked with opiates also. Uh, it was very, very common for uh, for people to go in and, and get their hit from a, from a house of prostitution. Um, and she was then accused of having overdose. She was let go about uh, 16 months later. She was pardoned by the governor and she was pardoned for the classic reason of a woman in a prison of about 180 hardened male criminals with a recipe for disaster. She had to have two guards on her at all times. She had to be segregated from, from any of the facilities that would exist in human territory prison. So she couldn't take advantage of any of the, the, the library or any of the classes that were offered. And she was effectively a fellow for her compliance that she was there. So 
everyone decided to just get rid of her uh, because of the problems that was that were happening on a regular basis uh, of, of men just trying to touch her, right? Um, which they were not allowed to do. So, um, all right. So, uh, no, I'd mentioned very quickly. I just want to just mention controlling narcotics and started to happen towards the end of the 19th century and moving into the 20th century as well as the nations got together and realized that there was a significant problem. They were successful enough to do it. And this is what I find so interesting that for most Americans today of 2023, they have no understanding of how widespread this was in the 19th century. None at all. Um, and, but in fact, it was omnipresent. It was ubiquitous. I can't find the strongest word to tell you how common it was. I like to characterize it that it was about as common as using Tylenol today and ibuprofen, right? Nobody thinks twice about it when you, you've got an A. That's how common it was back then. Is you just take a shot of morphine or opium or whatever it was that you needed. To. Um, so here are the implications, and this is what I want to share with you as well. So we know in Arizona history that there are some famous uh, individuals in Arizona's past that were addicts of opium or morphine. We knew that, but given how widespread it was used, how widespread it was available. It really raises questions in my mind how many other historical events were influenced in some fashion by drugs, by narcotics. And so I think, for example, the Pleasant Valley War, the number of people, things of that nature, moments of violence that, that are, that are um, stereotypical of the Arizona experience, how many of them were actually fueled by hard narcotics? I find it hard to believe that they were not simply because it was everywhere and it was accepted and widely used. And that's what I find rather interesting. Um, is it possible that the acts of violence and lawlessness that, that we are known for in, in popular culture uh, was due in some way uh, to the use of opiates as well? So it raises a very interesting question in my mind uh, for further consideration. So uh, that is it. That is it for my, my presentation. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, so we do have a few minutes for Q&A if there's any any questions that anyone would like to ask, and I will do my best to try. So, yes. Oh, what happened to Georgie? Well, I'm writing a book on this, so first of all, <laughs> stay tuned. Uh, but I can tell you very quickly, um, she had a very rough period. And so this is a period in where even the cures for addiction were positively medieval. They were. Copy enemas, cold gods. I mean, it was just medieval. She was sent to the territorial asylum in Santa Fe because the territory had no long term, I'm sorry, medical facilities for someone who wanted to be sent to the four times. In fact, one of the times she'd overcome it so badly that they actually wrote up her obituary. They expected she wouldn't survive the night. She was a tough woman and she pulled through. She eventually did become clean. Yes, she eventually came out of this nightmare of addiction. Uh, married a decent man who was a saloon keeper up in Prescott um, and reconciled with her family as well. And so there's evidence that uh, in her, I characterize as her later years of life, she was 35 when she got clean, right? So from my perspective, she was still very young. Right? But from that point going forward, she remained clean. There's no evidence at all that she, she dipped back into that, reconciled with her family, uh, had a reasonable life. She died at the age of about 65 years ago. Um, but if there's any silver lining to this, it's that, that she she got clean and she reconciled with her family. So yeah, that's what we came with. But it was, it was a harrowing run. It really was. It was very, very good. Thank you for that question. Uh, yes. Yes, they were. So we're talking about the snake oil salesman. This is an interesting thing about the, the image of the snake oil salesman. They always have a top hat, right? Always have, you know, a tie in the suit. Yes, it did happen. Yes, there were pharmaceuticals that sent. Okay, let me back up. 
Yes, there were businesses that produced patent medicine. They weren't necessarily pharmaceuticals, and they were they, the way that we think about it. Yes, they filled out salespeople that happened. What is more accurate is that the snake oil salesman was actually the local druggist who was usually the town doctor. Because the, the town doctor, there's mm -hmm. lots of evidence in, in Georgie's life, where many of the doctors she turned to were also agents for some of the patent medicine firms pushing their cures, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's not to say that the, the typical snake oil salesman didn't exist. They certainly did. But it was more common that you would simply get your snake oil either from the druggist or from your town dog. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I do have a question. First of all, thank you. This is very enlightening. I'm back here. Um, oh, thank they, you. <laughs> um, they, they hit it with the mic and you don't even need to see it. Um, but the, I was surprised that your, your presentation did not include the fact that, that it that if tuberculosis was uh, morphine was used to treat tuberculosis, and with the amount of tuberculosis, people did not often go into what we call sanitariums. So they were at home using it with everybody. And d did you do any statistics on that at all? The, the, the leaking of the two? Thank you for that. No, no I, I did not. So thank you. That's a very good question. Um, so again, what I'm trying to tell you is that morphine was certainly used by medical professionals to treat their patients, absolutely, but it was also overused, right? And we are we are in that situation now with the opioid epidemic. That epidemic. So yes, it was used for, and I would put in quotation mark, legitimate medical purposes. But again, this is a time when the field was in its wild west phase. <laughs> Forgive the, the description. In other words, these were. These, these were not uh, trained physicians in the way that we think about the medical field. Uh, people were largely experimenting on their own patients. So, yes, it was used, but people also suffered. So, thank you for that question. Yes. Uh, I actually have one from Wynne Brown, who is in our Zoom meeting here. Uh, she says, fascinating. Pearl Hart is another example of a young, addicted woman. Do you have a comment? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, I mentioned very briefly that some of our famous Arizona historical figures, uh, Jack Swilling, uh, but also Pearl Hart was also known as an opium addict. Um, but uh, again, they use uh, narcotics uh, quite widely. So even though you can read characterizations of Pearl as an opium addict, she used just about everything. But it, Georgie did too. Georgie, she was simply noted as a morphine addict in the prison records, but she used cocaine and everything as well. Again, because it's widely available and there are no prohibitions against using it at all, right? Or overusing it as the case may be. So yes, thank you for that. There are, ma again, many other well-known figures in Arizona's past that, that were users and abusers, yes. Would you just wait and I'll bring you the microphone. There's also one down here. But then anyway, there's someone back here. Yeah. You touched on it a little bit, but I was wondering if, as you're doing this research, how you see the parallels between, you know, today's opioid epidemics and, you know, oh. and, and the marketing of cures for pain that are actually quite addictive. And yes, there are sad parallels to the present uh, opioid ep epidemic that we have here. The, the overuse, the overprescription. Uh, the marketing from pharmaceuticals uh, because their interest really is making profit. Yes, there are direct parallels back then, but it, one of the key differences was that back then in the 19th century, there were absolutely no prohibitions about it, none at all. It was just available, fire beware, right? Now we have prohibitions. Yes, we have trained medical professionals. We like to believe that they are at the top of the game. So yes, there are parallels, but uh, different circumstances. But I was then I, I I bring it back then to where I suggested to you before that when you pain and when you live with pain, I understand why people will do anything to have a moment of relief. I understand that, and that's really the issue there. It's we live with pain. Right. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether there are trained medical professionals and, and federal standards and things like that. When you live with pain, 
people will do what they need to find some relief. And that's, to me, that's the real issue. We've yet to to conquer that one as, as, as a species, as a human race, if you will. And there was a question over here. Just a comment. Just growing up in the audio, you know, I remember when the methadone uh, clinics opened up, which is a derivative, and a lot of uh, the issues that happened with people who were due to heroin. And then uh, the other thing is, of course, with fentanyl and uh, meth today, you know, which is a whole entirely different uh, issue. Uh, but uh, I wanted to comment when I toured the uh, Litchfield Historical Museum on July 19th of this year, the doctor that served that community in the early 1900s, he donated all his tools, he or she, I'm not sure, donated all their tools and all their medications and they're behind a glass cabinet. And, you know, you can see, you can read the medications. They actually have like heroin and so on. So if anybody uh, wanted to see those in, uh, behind that cabinet, they're, they're at that museum. 13912 West Camelback. Thank you. That's a good question. I do have a lot of other stuff in the last one, but I'll be happy to show that. Yes. Hello. Um, I Yes, I was the one who proposed that caramel and meth being the cure to knee aches earlier. So I wanted to uh, say, I'm also a statistics student in college, and I was looking at the chart for the uh, main related, the causes of death along the past 13 years between 1869 and 1882, I believe, between the main causes of death. And honestly, that is depressing. But, well, obviously, but I feel like, I know the, there's the phrase history repeats itself, but with not, not with narcotics, but I feel like there's a lot of things, especially young, among the younger generation, that also happen to match that graph. Not just being murder or suicide, even though, even though they're rather prevalent, but also addiction and needing a relief from pain. That is, you're right. There is a need for relief. There is a need for a break. And there are many causes that get us there. May I also see the slide one more time? Uh, yes, yeah. let's, let's go, thank you. Thank you for that, for that comment. Uh, there we go. There we go. That's it. Okay. All right. Thank you for that comment. Thank you for your questions, and I will turn the mic back to you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Uh, we are now at the very end of our program here. Two last remaining items before we can get you upstairs for some cake. Some good food, good company, and of course our 50th anniversary. So now I'm going to invite Robert Ballard back up on stage to announce the results of the 2023 board officer elections. Thank you, sir. We have the results. Um, so for board president with 49 votes, Linda Elliott Nelson. For vice president with 49 votes, Denise Bauer. Board secretary, Deborah Bateman with 49 votes. And Linda, you're in. 46 votes, our new treasurer. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. Thanks for voting and participating and supporting. Thank you guys.